Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Can you hear that? Can you hear that sound in the background? Can you? Do you hear that? Keep listening. Keep listening. Turn up your volume. Put your ear to your speaker. Can you hear that? I don't know if you can, but ladies and gentlemen, that is the sound of roofs being replaced here in West Texas. Everyone knows that a, what, a month ago or so, we had a horrible storm come through. The hell storm lasted for like 20 minutes. Everyone. Oh, okay. Someone just said they do. All right. Someone can hear it. Well, that sound in the background is roofs being replaced here in West Texas. We had a bad storm. Hell storm lasted for like 20 minutes. Everybody's roof in the entire neighborhood, their roofs are all destroyed. So everybody's roofs are being replaced. Uh, Monday was my roof part of Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning all the way up to Tuesday night around 10 o'clock uh, last night was my neighbor on the one side getting his roof replaced. Now the neighbor on the other side is getting his roof replaced. It's been loud and I haven't been able really to do much live broadcasting, but I was sitting here in the studio going, I, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to, I've got to do something. Like, what do I do? So, all right. Someone said it's not bad at all. I'm very appreciative of that. Thank, so thank you very much for telling me that. It, in my ear, it sounds, it's, it's loud and I don't wear headphones. Uh, to monitor myself when I uh, live broadcast, I just that just drives me insane to hear myself. I, I can't stand that. So I don't wear a monitoring headphones when I broadcast. I know you're supposed to do that if you're a true professional, but I, I don't because then if I hear anything in the background through the headphones, it's even more distracting and it's already distracting here. So we're just going to press on. So here's what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to return to our kind of Law and gospel study, we're kind of redoing it in a sense. Remember, we started the law and gospel study in October of 2022. We did like 80 plus hours of work and study on the subject of law and gospel. And then the series jumped the shark. And then I felt like I lost the plot, lost control of everything. And so then I was like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And lo and behold, Issues ETC, it's a Lutheran radio program and podcast. You should subscribe to it. Issues ETC or Issues Etc. You should subscribe to it. They started doing a series entitled The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel Part 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I don't even know how many parts they've done. And so I'm, I thought, you know what we will do to kind of get us restarted? We'll kind of do a redo and we'll go back and look at how they b built up and how they move to where we kind of stopped because they're using the same book I was using. They're using God's no and God's yes, the proper distinction between law and gospel by C.F.W. Walther. So in this book, there's 25 theses on the proper distinction between law and gospel. We stopped, I think, at thesis number 11. So we're going back and listening to what they had to say. They're currently on thesis number two. And remember how we are doing this. Issues ETC is a radio program, meaning they have commercials all the time. So what we're doing is we're finding their discussion in between the commercials and only reviewing that. And when they get ready to go to a break, we're not editing out the break and then coming in with it. No, we're just stopping our our program right there because it makes these episodes a little shorter. And I'm hoping a little shorter, maybe kind of a little uh, m much more of a summary will help some of these things stick so that when we get back to where we were Everyone will be ready to move forward and we can finally get this series to some kind of a dramatic conclusion probably 50 years from now. But at some point, we'll, we'll bring this series to a dramatic conclusion. So are you ready? We're going to go back to issues ETC as they're discussing thesis number two in the book, God's No, God Yes, The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C.F.W. Walther. And thesis number two reads, let me remind you, only he is an orthodox teacher who not only presents the all the articles of faith in accordance with scripture, but also rightly distinguishes from each other the law and the gospel. If you want it now, not everyone agrees with this perspective or this thesis, but the thesis of CFW Walther is, hey, look, 
You see that church over there? If you want to know if it's an orthodox church, if it's a sound church, if it teaches correct doctrine, do they rightly distinguish between law and gospel? If they do not, then they are not an orthodox church. They are not a good church. Are they a good Bible teacher? No matter how many other things they get right, if they do not rightly distinguish between law and gospel, they are not. Most people will disagree with that thesis, and I understand that. Most will. Because it's very hard to find people who will draw a proper distinction between law and gospel. So what they do, they, they, they obliterate the distinction between law and gospel. And guess what? What they really give you is law masquerading as gospel. You think you're getting gospel when really you're getting law. And that is not only detrimental to your spiritual life. You could argue pretty close to a false gospel. All right. Now, they just took a a commercial break. They're going to come back to work a little bit more on thesis number two. Let's see what they have to do. I think this is a relatively short segment. So hopefully we can get something accomplished before the noise next door gets too loud. And I'm, I'm sorry if you're hearing all of that. I'm sorry. But hey, focus on law and gospel, not on roofing and West Texas when it's 175 degrees outside. Okay, just just forget that. Law and gospel, not roofing. All right, here we go. Issues Etc. Book of the Month for May is called Gathered by Christ, the Overlooked Gift of the Church. It is about the church from two perspectives, Christ's perspective, and then our perspective as Christ delivers the gifts of salvation and life through his church. Find out more about Gathered by Christ at our website, issuesetc.org, or call Concordia Publishing House and ask for the Issues Etc. Book of the Month for May, Gathered by Christ, 1-800-325-3040. 1-800-325-3040. Pastor Will Whedon is our guest. We're talking about Walther's Law and Gospel Theses in our series with him. So, Will, Walther takes us to Zechariah 7 about, I believe it is an account of, I tended the flock doomed to slaughter for the sake of my miserable sheep, and I took two staffs. One I named Favor, the other I named Woe, and I tended the sheep. What does Walther do with that? Yeah, and it's worthwhile noting those two, the names of the staffs, right? So the, the one beauty, favor, I think uh, Luther has here like softness, if you will. The other, woe, is what Luther, the way Luther translates it. Union is the way ESV translates it. And the picture here is of a shepherd having two staves, two rods that he uses. The one beauty, the other bands. The beauty is the gospel. The bands is the law. And he must know, you know, okay, which one are you going to use on who? (laughs) If you got a sheep who is intent on going astray, guess which one it gets. If you get one that's being hesitant to follow because it's trembling and in fear, it gets the beauty rod, the rod of the gospel itself. So this picture is a beautiful way of uh, the the twofold uh, rods in the hands of Christ is a beautiful way of understanding the distinction between the law and gospel. And let's just throw in here, Walter throws in a parenthetical thought on this where he just says, Luther's translation of this passage is unexcelled. Would that people who want to revise Luther's Bible would stick to their own private affairs? (laughs) (laughs) He he loves the old Luther text. He also warns against what he calls the mingling of law and gospel because Now, just so you know, I think they said Zechariah 7, which is incorrect. It's Zechariah chapter 11, verse 7. I think think he said 7-11, but it's 11-7. If he didn't say it incorrectly, I apologize. But it's Zechariah 11-7. Maybe I heard it incorrectly, but as soon as I heard what I thought I heard, I knew that was wrong. So I looked it up. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 7. You may want to spend some time meditating on it. And let me read it to you. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 7. And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you. O poor of the flock, and I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. Clearly, there are wild differences, wide differences when it comes to translating these two staves and what they're called. The the King James says beauty and bands. 
Beauty and Bands. I'm going to grab over here another Bible. Let me move everything. I'm going to grab a Bible over here. Another one. I'm going to go to Zechariah, a chapter 11 again. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 7. This was translated this way. So I shepherd the flock, intended for slaughter the oppressed of the flock. I had two staffs calling one favor and the other union. Now, I understand that it could be very much a temptation here to connect this to law and gospel. You can do your own work on why there's such wide range of translations, which one is the best. And then you really need to look at all of chapter 11 and try to figure out exactly the who, what, where, when, and how of Zechariah 11.7. Maybe we need to make this a priority and we'll circle back to it. And maybe we'll do an, a, a separate this from just like its own podcast episode. We can put it here in the study of law and gospel, or maybe we'll just do like a kind of a little bit of work on Zechariah chapter 11, but I would, I would challenge you to go look at it because sometimes when you're studying like a doctrine or, or a theology and you're like, whoa, this is, you know, this theology, this idea is so good. This idea of law and gospel, which I believe is biblical is so good. If you're not careful, you start reading it maybe in verses where it's not really what's being spoken of. So you on your own, Figure out what Zechariah 11.7 is actually about. Let me know. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. I would love to get your thoughts and listen to a bunch of sermons on it to see how others handle it. Because it's easy just to immediately go full-blown symbolic. But even if you go full-blown symbolic, the symbolism would have to mean something to the original hearers, right? Are they going to understand that? Oh, that's the proper distinction between law and gospel. What's going on? So you can, um, you can see um, how that would all work. All right, let's continue. As he says, you end up with a third thing that is neither law nor gospel, therefore really not God's word at all. No, it ends up being sheer poison, he says. You know, it'll ruin your hearers. If- okay, now what they just said, I know I kind of I cut them off in the middle, that if you do not properly distinguish between law and gospel, you don't end up with law, you don't end up with gospel. He says you end up with... with with poison, I would say it this way. When you obliterate law and gospel, I I, I always say you end up with law. And that is the case. When you obliterate the distinction between law and gospel, you will only end up with law because law is our natural default position. We think law that that's, that's just, it's in us. But I, I think I've modified it a little bit. And I think I would say now that when you obliterate the proper distinction between law and gospel, you end up with a gospel You'll end up with a law masquerading as a gospel because you'll think you're preaching the gospel, but it's really law. It's law masquerading as gospel. That's what will happen. And I, and I think we, and I think that's what you get in a lot of churches. They would tell you they believe in the gospel. They would tell you they believe you say by the salvation, uh, the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. They would even mention imputed righteousness. But if you listen long enough, you'll find out that it's simply law masquerading as gospel. They'll throw in gospel language, but when you when you finally boil it down, it's law, law, law. That's that's my thesis as of now. You can disagree with me, but there you go. But let's see what they have to say. If you've uh, mingled the two together, and so you have to be able to terrify the impenitent with the threats of God's wrath and displeasure, and at the same time, you need to be able to proclaim to the penitent, the forgiveness of their sins, which has been fully won for them for the whole world by the suffering and death of the Son of God. And as I said before, you know, everything Walther is doing in here is he's demolishing the human drive to build a bridge between the law and the gospel. He's like, there is no bridge between them. They don't need a bridge. What they need is each to stand as the word of God it was created to be, that it might do the job that God sent it to do. So I think that's uh, uh, the the way then that uh, Walter will proceed to explicate 2 Timothy 2.15, that we need to rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, the, The picture really is of apportioning the food at the proper time. But Walter applies that then to knowing who to give the gospel to and knowing who to give the law to and knowing the time at which to deliver either one. 
didn't you say last time this has implications beyond the sermon? It has implications in the confessional, too. When somebody comes confessing their sins, it's important to know, wait a minute, it is, where does this person stand in relationship to the sin they are confessing? Are they defending it and trying to excuse it? In which case, they don't get the gospel spoken to them. Or are they actually uh, terrified by this and desiring to hear God's word of forgiveness and to receive with that the strength of the Holy Spirit to fight against that sin in their life? In the uh, fifth evening lecture, he says, it's a matter of utmost importance for you that before you teach others, you first obtain a very thorough and vital knowledge for yourselves of the things that God, by his prophets and apostles, has revealed for the salvation of men. Then he launches into, I believe, some testimonies of a Lutheran theologian of the third generation, Johann Gerhard. Yeah, uh, he, he's kind of, I don't like the way he kind of uh, denigrates Gerhard in a way. He says, well, he's not Luther, but, you know, he's still really worth hearing. I, he meant that he doesn't have the, <laughs> remember how he said you shouldn't pay too much attention to the rhetorical force? You should pay attention to what is said. Gerhard does not have the rhetorical force of Luther, but Gerhard is actually much more consistent and uh, careful in his statement of doctrine. That's that's sort of a pattern that you see growing in the Lutheran dogmaticians each generation. The sheer force of, of Luther's spiritual experience in angst and the peace that he found in the gospel shaped that early generation. But that was like kind of, can I put it like clearing the forest, right? You know, he's he's got a mess to clear up and he's not really concerned so much about carefully building things up. That's what follows in the succeeding generations. And each one does a, a, a bang up job with that. Gerhard is one of my all time favorite theologians. So he begins quoting him. He says, this distinction must be observed all the time, but especially at two points. And first point should become as no surprise, the article on justification, since we are not justified by the law, which owing to the corruption and weakness of our flesh is in a certain way, though accidentally incapacitated for this task, saying it's not the law's fault, it's our fault because of our corruption, but because the law does not bend, it does not belong in the doctrine of justification at all, because we can't keep it. You put together any work that you do in obedience to the law, all that the law is going to show you about that work is that it's a sinful work. That's so important. The law does not belong in the doctrine of justification. Justification is the doctrine and how a sinner can be made just before a holy God. The law is not involved in justification. When you use the law to determine someone's justification, you are bringing something that doesn't belong in the doctrine of justification. Justification is not determined by my keeping of any law, my doing or not doing. You can't judge my justification by what I do and not do because my justification is determined by Christ who kept the law for me. So if you want to bring law into my justification, whatever law you say, hey, this proves you're saved. I'm like, okay, great. Give me 50, give me a list of 30 things that proves I'm saved. Thank you. Guess what? Go look at Christ. He took care of all 30. And all the ones that I failed, they've all been paid for. So you cannot use that to say this proves I'm saved because even if you do that, I would be like Christ took care of them all. It's all, all of the law was kept all the law was paid. God's wrath was satisfied. All my sins were paid for. My justification has literally nothing to do with the law. It has everything to do with the finished work of Jesus Christ. But so many in the church wants to grab the law and bring it in and go, okay, okay, the law may not save you, but the law is the thing that proves whether you're saved or not saved by what you do or don't do. Meaning then that I'm saved by what I do or don't do. And if they say, no, 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 no. It's not that you're saved by it, but if you don't do it, it proves you were never saved. Meaning if I don't do it, then I wasn't saved. Meaning you've just now added the law to salvation. Any law you bring to me saying, hey, this proves you're saved. I'll be like, okay, great. Take it up with Jesus because he did all of that for me. That doesn't, that doesn't excuse me living in sin or pursuing sin. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the reality is justification is finished by the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's all it can show you. 
And therefore, it sort of excludes all of our works from justification. So we can't be saved by the law. But God then provides some other means. That is, our justification is from the gospel, in which the righteousness that is valid in God's sight is revealed without the law. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So all now depends on the other means which God has provided on our accepting these tidings of great joy, the gospel. And it's in the doctrine of justification without which the Bible would sink to the level of any other book of morals. I love that. Take away the the doctrine of justification and you've gutted the Bible of the actual power and force it has to save. So Gerhard goes on. For this reason, men should be exhorted and urged to perform good works according to the norm of the law. These works, however, must not be brought into the august place where our justification in the sight of God occurs. For at that point, there's a ceaseless conflict between man's doing and his believing, between God's grace and man's works, between law and gospel. So Walter adds, woe to us then if we're about to expound gospel and we mingle law with it. That is what we are doing in expounding the gospel. We say more than accept this message. Every addition would be of law. Again, I'm going to quote my friend Todd Wilkin. He says, Jesus plus. Anything that's a plus to Jesus, that is an act of law that's added on to something you need to do. In contrast to that, the gospel of justification is that Christ has freely, fully, and completely obtained salvation for the entire world by his life and his suffering, and his dying, and by the validation of that by his Father and his resurrection. A couple of things. Without the proper distinction between law and gospel, Christianity basically becomes a system of morality. It becomes nothing more than a moral system. It's just another system of morality. Law and gospel makes it different because Christianity then, yes, there's morality. It's God's law. No, we cannot keep it. Christ saves us apart from the law. And then let me read Romans chapter 3, verse 21, which was alluded to there. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Here we go. Verse 20. Romans 3.20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the deeds of the law, no one is justified. And if by the deeds of the law, no one is justified, then you can't use the deeds of the law to prove if someone was justified. Why? Look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. We are not looking for a righteousness that comes from the law. We are are looking for a righteousness that comes apart from the law. And that is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In him, I have a perfect righteousness that has nothing to do with my keeping of the law or failing to keep the law. I am declared perfectly righteous without the law. But everyone wants to say, no, 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 you're saved or not saved by, and and we know that based off what you do. Well, now you're looking for a righteousness that comes from the keeping of the law to somehow prove I'm saved. No, 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 my doing can't prove that I'm saved because I'm saved by a righteousness that comes from apart from the law. I know this is radical to the minds of of evangelicals in 2023 and the American church, but you, I'm sorry, you have bought in more to a Roman Catholic idea than a true non-Catholic understanding of a forensic justification, a legal justification, or a justification, as we would say, based off an alien righteousness or an imputed righteousness. All right. So let, let's, let's continue. Pastor Will Whedon is our guest. He's assistant pastor at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Hamill, Illinois, and he hosts the daily 15-minute verse-by-verse Bible study produced by Lutheran Public Radio called The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. Another illustration of this slight mingling of law with gospel after this. And that's our cue to stop this episode, okay? I told you it was going to be a short segment, but this works perfectly because of all the noise going on next door. This just 
once again, just places this before you to understand the proper distinction between law and law and gospel. You've got to get this down. And I'm telling you, any church that does not give you this proper distinction reduces Christianity to nothing more than a moral system. And I'm, and I, and I'm going to stand by this. What they do, the obliteration of law and gospel will simply hand you a, the law masquerading as gospel, meaning you're going to just end up with law. Meaning you're just going to end up with a moral system, but you're going to be told that you're being given the gospel and you're going to believe it's the gospel and you're going to say that. And then you're going to find yourself over and over and over thinking about, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. Am I truly saved? I don't know if I'm saved because I keep doing this and I got to do this. And everyone's going to be telling you, this is how you know you're saved. Do this, check this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And all it is is law, 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 law. And if you're even remotely honest with yourself, if you're even remotely honest with your thoughts, desires, feelings, feelings and wants. You're going to be like, woe is me. I am undone. I never live up to this. There's something wrong with me. No, you're still a sinner. Yeah, there is something wrong with you. You're still a sinner and your salvation is not based on you being a sinner. It's based on Christ being perfect, dying for you and imputing his righteousness to you by faith alone. That is what we need to understand. All right. I apologize for all the noise in the background, but I wanted to get something done. Now, I've handed you a lot of things to work on. Zechariah 11, 7, the two staves. What's going on there? There's a little, that's kind of like a, we're mixing in a today's focus here as well. There's your today's focus. There's your law and gospel redo. I think this is part seven. And then if everything works out correctly tonight at Victory Baptist Church, away from the sound of the roofers, coming to you from the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church in the middle of nowhere, Texas. If everything works right, we'll be in Jeremiah chapter 13. That will begin at 7 p.m. Central Time, or as I like to say, 7 p.m. the actual time, because Texas time is the actual time, and all the other states have fraudulent time. All right, there you go. All right, I'm going to hurry up and stop before it gets loud again. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. Everyone have a great day. Meditate deeply on these things. Love to hear from you. God bless.